Good afternoon. I'm Flora Peywandi, professor of internal medicine at University of Milan, and I'm the director of Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center of Angelo Bianchi Bonomi and Policlinico of Milano. I'm going to report the data on gene therapy in hemophilia. And what is the goal of my presentation? To have a review on history of hemophilia and how the treatment of patients affected with hemophilia changed in the last 40 years, starting from replacement therapy, moving to gene therapy, which would be the actual and future therapy for patients. The objective of what is uh, my presentation and lots of activity of ISTH during the next years is education, especially in a difficult field of gene therapy and understanding how gene therapy does work, what that means for the patient, for the physician, and how we can achieve to that point and what we need to know. Hemophilia treatment is a replacement therapy based on intravenous administration of a deficient clotting factor. In case of hemophilia A, we are making administration of factor 8. In hemophilia B, that would be factor 9. As I said, there was a large change on treatment of patients with hemophilia. And that was a big evolution from 50s when a patient with hemophilia was treated with whole blood. Then it has been started the treatment with FFP, with cryoprecipitate, then in 70s with plasma derived product. And unfortunately, we did have a very dark period and gray area of treatment of patient with hemophilia with infections of our patient with hepatitis C and HIV. And then later on during 90s, we did have a chance to use the data of the uh, cloning of factor eight and factor nine, which has been obtained in 80s with the first generation of recombinant factor eight getting to the market in 92 and uh, in 94, we had the second generation of recombinant factor 9. And going on and on, it was a large improvement in the quality of the factors, taking less human proteins in the products and making them safer and safer. So that means the problem of HIV and HCV has been almost solved and most of the uh, problem related to the infection transmitted by the uh, blood product. And we got up to 2015 with the fourth generation of recombinant factor 8, which was not containing any type of the human proteins. So the best part of this evolution, which I, I mentioned, it was safety. Definitely that has been changed and we completely understood how the two system of virus inactivation with heat treatment and solvent uh, detergent and the further type of uh, purification like filtering and uh, the new techniques was making the product safer and safer. At the same time, also the treatment and strategies of the patient were changing. Patients were treated at the beginning, only at the time of the bleeding uh, as on-demand treatment. But then later on, we did understand that clinical picture of our patients affected with mild hemophilia or moderate hemophilia were significantly different compared to those with less than 1% of activity, which were called severe hemophilia. So the number of the spontaneous bleeding episodes in patients with the minimum residual factors, about 1 to 2 to 3%, was much less compared to the severe patient. And that was a good teaching point to our physician to change the phenotype of patient by prophylactic treatment with a regular intravenous infusion of the deficient clotting factor in order to change the picture of the bleeding manifestation in our patient. And that is 
still ongoing for hemophilia A patient with two, three times intravenous infusion and for hemophilia B about two times per week. So as you can imagine, so the safety improves significantly, but still for those, especially adolescents and children, to have two to three intravenous infusion was not easy. It was complicated, especially if the venous access was not perfect, if the, uh, the kid, they didn't have the good venous access for the parents, that was difficult. The problem of, you know, thrombosis, infection. So all those was making very difficult the situation. And that was due to the short half-life of the factors, which was associated to the frequency injection. And at the same time, we were having a peak and we, have, uh, we were having the trough, which was very frequent. So the levels were high immediately after the injection and much lower after eight to 12 hours. But that means our patient were not in a complete protection because the levels were not stable and that was the aspects of therapeutical um, corner which needed to be changed and we needed more protection for our patients so that means the standard product however were really changing the quality of life of our patient with home treatment with prophylactic therapy but they still were not suboptimal and that was the reason over the last 10 years, the treatment of hemophilia improved significantly with novel therapeutic options, which was trying to optimize the management of patient with and without inhibitors. Now, what is the inhibitor? Inhibitors are those antibodies against factor eight mainly, and sometimes against factor nine, which making neutralizing uh, the activity of factor and the patient could not be any more treated with factor eight and need more intensive type of therapy and also expensive type of treatment which is called bypassing agent so what are these novel therapeutic options three strategy are the new type of treatment which has been started in the last few years and is moving on significantly. One is extended half-life products, second non-replacement therapy, and the third one gene therapy. I'm trying just to show where we are standing with the results for each single category of products. As extended half-life products, two type of strategies has been used. The first on the left side is pegylation, which means a chemical coupling polyethylene glycol is bind to the recombinant factor eight, which is able to increase the hydrodynamic volume of the molecules, and this is preventing the clearance of this molecule by the kidney. The size of the pegylation could be different from 5 kilodalton to 10, 20, 40, or sometimes 60 kilodalton. The second category of products were fusion proteins, and that could be done by binding a fusion of fragment crystallizable FC region of a IgG immunoglobulin, or it could be albumin, which could bind to recombinant factor eight or factor nine. And even this strategy is reducing the clearance of the molecule by kidney and increasing the half-life of the product in the circulation. And uh, the FC fragment and albumin are getting recycled through the receptor of FC ligand at the endothelial cell surface, which is increasing the half-life of the molecules. It's very important to be able at the end of this session to this question. Pegylation, FC fusion, and albumin fusion are strategies used for the development of extended half-life concentrates for hemophilia A and B. What is the relative increase in half-life of this product compared with the standard half-life concentrate? From A to E, you can see the different responses. Factor eight extended half-life, 1.2 to 1.5 fold increase, and for factor nine, two to three fold increase. 
B, for factor 8, 1.5 to 1.6 fold increase, and for factor 9, 3 to 6 fold increase. For C, 2 fold increase for factor 8, and 1.5 fold increase for factor 9. And D, 3.5 fold increase for factor 8, and 6 to 8 fold increase for factor 9. And finally, I'm not sure about the response. And what I'm trying to show you is what we have achieved for factor 8 and factor 9 extension half-life. As I said, the technologies were pegylation and fusions. Different companies tried to use these two strategies, producing totally four products of factor 8, three pegylated and one FC fusion recombinant factor 8, and three factor 9 extended half-life product, each by every single type of, of technique. One pegylated, uh, factor 9 glycopegylated product, factor 9 FC fusion product, and factor 9 albumin fusion product. Now, of course, the main question is which of this product is working better in terms of the safety and efficacy? And do we have enough data to understand as a physician which product is safer or is uh, better than the others? I tried to put all data together and it seems for factor 8, we are achieving about an increase of 50 to 60 percent uh, fold increase for factor 8 and that was more or less similar to all products. And if we make the association and the effect that this kind of increase did have in the life of patient is reducing the number of the infusion annually about 30 to 35 percent in hemophilia A patients. And what about the protection? As you remember, I explained that prophylaxis is a method to keep the level of factor 8 or factor 9 higher than 1%. But with the standard of light product, it was very difficult with the actual number of infusion to get to 3 to 5% trough level for protection of patients. And here we can see that some of the patient could have up to 3% or even a little bit higher. So if we put all this data together, we can conclude that using extended half-life products, patients with severe hemophilia A could be converted to a moderate phenotype. And that means uh, less number of bleeding and less number of infusion. And we need more real-life data to understand how is the efficacy of these patients in the future. In terms of hemophilia B for the extended half-life products, we have seen that the products with factor 9 works much better and the results were much more exciting about three to six fold increase has been seen between FC products up to albumin and pegylated product. And that means the number of infusion in hemophilia B patient were associated to almost 50 to 60, 65% reduction. And especially the trough level was very importantly increased up to five to 10 international unit. And that, in clinical picture of patient, means patient with severe hemophilia could be converted to a mild phenotype. And that means a lot. And that means a significant change in quality of life of patient with hemophilia B. So if we have to conclude for the extended half-life product of factor 9, we can say that we achieved the goal, and even for factor 8, we can say we got a partial result. However, that was interesting about reduction of 30 to 35 percent of factor 8, but we want more. And why that limitation is existing? 
So we did have the number of infusion which are reduced. We did have a higher trough level and we did have the decrease of the bleeds which needs more real life data in the future. But we did not have the complete result that we were waiting. And why that was happening? That was happening because factor eight in the circulation is going around by it, by it carriers, which is von Willebrand factor. And the half-life of von Willebrand factor in the circulation is about 18 hours. And we cannot have a higher extension more than uh, what von Willebrand factor could have if you are not changing our strategy. And that's the reason why the next generations of the extended half-life product, and actually two of them are uh, already available, and not in the market yet, in the clinical trials, are containing a fragment of von Willebrand factor. The first one is a molecule of FC factor 8 recombinant added to D prime D3 von Willebrand factor with the X10, which is a polypeptide uh, which is biodegradable and is reducing again the clearance by the kidney. And the second molecule is the single chain factor eight recombinant infused to albumin. And uh, this is again a next generation of the extended half-life product. And that molecule also added to D prime D3 of von Willebrand factor. And if you look on the results of the first molecule, which I mentioned as a recombinant FC von Willebrand X10, it seems to be very interesting and the phase one and two trial in severe hemophilia A patient showed a extension up to 37 hours and uh, the average activity of factor eight was 13 percent at every five days and 5.6 percent at seven day post infusion and that is changing significantly the quality of life of hemophilia A patients also in the future. We are now opening the second group of drugs, non-replacement therapy for hemophilia, which is a big revolution in the treatment of patient, new mechanism of action. There are few questions and you have to guess which one is correct. And only one of the answer is the correct one. Now we are moving to the second group of treatment, non-replacement therapy for hemophilia patient, which is uh, acting with a different mechanism of actions. Here, we are not making administration of factor eight and factor nine. We have different uh, type of action to do. We can make the inhibition of anti-natural anticoagulant. With this one, we can empower the generation of thrombin, and in this way, we can have more efficacious uh, hemostasis, and that could be done by inhibition of activated protein C. It could be done by uh, using the inhibitor of anti-tissue factor pathway inhibitor by using the monoclonal antibodies. We can downregulate the transcription of uh, uh, antithrombin and the RNA by silencing RNA. And uh, that again would be the anticoagulant effect. Or we can use completely different uh, method by bypassing or mimicking factor eight using biospecific monoclonal antibody against factor 9A and factor 10. And I'm sure in the future, we would find even a novel type of a strategy, but this is uh, what we know about hemostasis and is a different mechanism of actions. Being a different mechanism of actions, that means to measure factor eight and nine is not enough. We do need to learn what type of assay we have to use and how we have to evaluate the efficacy of hemostasis when we are using this product, and especially during the bleeding when we are combining this product with the other type of agents and uh, hemostatic products. 
The only product which is already available is a biospecific humanized antibodies that I'm going to show. And the rest of them, they are on clinical trial. And uh, some of them are in phase two, advancing to phase three. And soon most of them would be available. And the Serpin PC is in preclinical and soon would be in phase one clinical trial. As a Mesitsumab again, completely novel strategy of treatment called ACE910 or emicitumab is a chimeric biospecific humanized antibody against factor 9A and factor 10. That means this product mimics the cofactor function of factor 8 binding to factor 9A with one arm and factor 10 with the other, placing them in a specially appropriate position and promoting the factor 9A catalyzed factor 10 activation. This type of property is changing significantly the treatment of patients affected with hemophilia A with and without inhibitor and could be used for both group of patients as has been shown this cartoon. FDA and EMA approve emicitumab for prophylaxis in both adults and pediatric patients with hemophilia A with and without inhibitors. And 3 mg per cage once weekly for the first four weeks, followed by 1.5 mg once weekly as a maintenance dose has been used at the beginning. And now this interval could be every two weeks or could be even every four weeks in the future could not be used for on-demand treatment during the acute bleeding and is only for the prophylaxis. This product is now available in United States for both patients, as I said, with and without inhibitor, and in Europe is mainly available for patients with inhibitor, and in some European country also could be available in patients without inhibitor. At the beginning of the clinical trial to use the emicitumab, uh, we did have three episodes of thrombotic macroangiopathy, particularly in association with activated prothrombin complex with a high dosage in the first 24 hours. But after we did understand the combination of this drug could be harmful for the patients, then we tried to change the therapeutic strategy to other bypassing agent, and from there we did not have the other cases of TMA. Few thrombotic events and 10 cases of death has been reported, and three were the, uh, during the usage of the product by the compassionate use. And one case of the neutralizing antibody against the drug has been reported. Now this data is coming also, especially for the uh, report of the mortality on the site of uh, Roche, which uh, as you can uh, acknowledge, we did not have such a data for all other type of product. Therefore, we need to have a very good post-registration surveillance to look for the safety and efficacy of not only this drug, but every novel drug in the future to understand how they are working and how is the safety of these products. And since now the number reported until now are what I showed in the slides. So as a summary, we could say that new therapeutic strategies seems to change significantly the treatment of the patient and have a significant improvement in the bleeding control over current standards of care of patients with and without inhibitor. And some safety concerns remain and that require implementation of risk mitigation strategy, which uh, some of them has been already started and some of them we do need to understand better because the patient treated, especially with non-replacement therapy, they are not any more severe 
other patients, they are mild or moderate, and we do need to learn better how to treat them during the acute bleeding. So therefore, again, my recommendation would be long-term observation and educational plan for patients and physicians. We need to teach to our physicians who are not very expert and also to our patients that these drugs are different and they need to learn it better. And we need to understand better how they are working. The last category, which are gene therapy, our replacement of this functional gene with an exogenous functional gene which is curing or bringing a long-term expression of the gene which was not functional. The preclinical studies of gene therapy started in 97 up to 2006 and first clinical trial using the AAV2 has been used by Avigen in 2006, as I said, on hemophilia B. However, the expression remained just for a short period of time. And then after almost four years, the group of uh, Professor Amit Natvani and Ted Todenham at University College of London with uh, our colleague of St. Jude's Children Research Hospital used the new AAV8 uh, vector and treated the first patients with severe hemophilia B and the first six treated patient in with different three different dosages showed a good result and then the number uh, has been increased up to 10 patients and almost now we are about nine years from the starting of gene therapy and no issue with the safety has been seen and the level of expression remained almost stable and that was a very important result in the field of hemostasis obtained by this group in London. After this result, different companies started uh, to use the strategy of adeno-associated gene therapy uh, with different dosages, and uh, later on, it has been inserted a new component of uh, mutation reported by the group of Padua, the gene variant which was able to increase the level of expression. And with that one, the second generation of gene therapy started with about 80 to 33% reported by Spark. And that expression uh, now is available also with the results of the Unicure and is just changing the picture of the treatment of patient with severe hemophilia B. For hemophilia A, as you know, the gene therapy is even more complicated because the gene is larger, is bigger, is more complicated. Therefore, different methods and strategies like codon optimization, B domain deletion uh, with a liver specific promoter has been used, and in vivo gene expression has been used in mice and non human primates in 2004 to 2011, and the first in human. A uh, gene therapy clinical trial was done using AAV5 by Biomarine, and this result has been published uh, in New England Journal of Medicine and was showing the interesting results. And now in this table, you can see how things are moving, and there are different companies uh, trying to bring the usage of different levels of vector by using AAV2, AAV5, and AAV8 uh, vectors. And again, as I said, the different expressions of factor eight has been achieved by Marine did come with the normalization of the expression of the factor eight, and that result is amazing. And uh, now we do hope to see a good result as it has been uh, reported by the Biomarine uh, release that they did have on their website for phase three clinical trial during the ISTH of this year in Melbourne. And again, also other company are bringing the interesting result. If I have to, to put together what I was just trying in this half an hour uh, presentation to report, that in addition to what I said about extended half-life product and non-replacement therapy, also gene therapy seems to be a powerful approach in the management 
of hemophilia and could offer a long term and finally uh, in the future using other type of vector like lentiviral or even the strategies like editing uh, might cure definitely, but we can say results of uh, clinical trial of gene therapy using the adeno-associated viral vector show definitely long-term expression with factor nine. The result with factor eight uh, will be reported during the ISTH after three years. And of course, in all these patients, our society has a big uh, responsibility to teach to all physicians and scientists and uh, the patient how to follow up the long-term surveillance in terms of the gain safety and efficacy. And we do need to design the minimal data set that's gonna be used by every center and every patient treated with the gene therapy should be in this database and the national databases uh, and international with the link of these national databases should be available and the regulatory should have access to this data and with academia and this type of independent data collection should give us clear information in the, uh, whether this type of strategy are good and efficacious as we are seeing now. Critical issues, all is beautiful, but still I think we do need to have an eye on the durability of the clothing factor expression in the gene therapy. We do need to understand why we do have after eight to 12 weeks after the injection, increase of the liver enzymes and what is the element in some of the patient is causing the increase of this enzyme in some of them not. The safety profile of different serotype of AAV need to be understood. The effect of the vector manufacturing process and the level of expressions and variability between the different patient and from one batch to the other one of the vector. The potential genotoxicity, which is extremely important, and we do need to understand whether we have integrating gene del delivery vector uh, to the liver. Is there any risk and how um, percent is this integration and whether this is safe? and that would be really important for us in the future to have some data on the liver biopsy of patient, uh, patients who've been treated with the gene therapy. And finally, we do need to understand what type of lab assays we do need to use because otherwise what we are achieving with one clinical trial is different from the other one and we cannot compare the efficacy of the results achieved with two different types of strategy. Thank you very much for your attention.